So I want you to reimagine when you were a child and you first started watching movies. I mean, when I was a kid, I loved movies, and I assume that everyone here also loved movies as a kid, unless you're weird. Because when you're a kid, movies are this magical thing made in a faraway land called Hollywood. Not so far away now, although that's one of the many disappointments of becoming an adult. But I also fell in love with computers. And the reason that I fell in love with computers was because of movies. And it was because I discovered this. Now, I know it doesn't look like a lot to you, but I never realized as a kid I could actually make a movie. And so this was like the first 3D program that I ever saw, and I could actually make like simple animations. I was like, wait a minute. Movies aren't something done in a faraway place by adults who have money and power and magic. This is something that I can do. It was like a, one of those aha moments that you get. So the problem, though, is that this is the early 90s, and computers are really, really slow. It would take hours to render a single frame. So being a smart kid and not having a lot of money, I said, OK, if I could get a lot of computers at the same time, I could make this go a lot faster. So where do you go if you want a lot of computers? Well, that led me to my first job at a place called the Exploratorium. It's an amazing science museum in San Francisco. I highly recommend that you all go there. During the day, I would teach kids science classes. And then at night, I'd take over the whole computer network, and they had hundreds of computers. It was awesome. And that's how I started to make my movies. Now, of course, this is now mid-90s in San Francisco. So this becomes the epicenter of the whole big dot-com boom. And the internet, because Al Gore had invented the internet by then, the internet becomes really popular. And that led me to the begin my career working at a bunch of Silicon Valley startups. And it was great. I spent eight years, and I worked on all kinds of crazy technologies. I worked on medical systems all the way to, like, wireless technologies. It was a great time. But the problem was I had gotten into technology because I had wanted to tell stories. And that itch was still there. So how do I transition? Luckily, I got a big break and I got into the UCLA School of Film and Television. And at the time, it was really hard to get in, but they recognized that movies were becoming more and more dependent on technology. So they said, OK, we'll give this guy a chance. And it was great, because I already had that tech side down. But now, going to film school was a complete reversal. I had to learn the other side of the coin. Learning tell stories is actually really, really difficult. Because if you think about how Hollywood tells stories, it's very different from the way that you and I tell stories. Their problem is, today, they have a bigger audience than they've ever had in their entire history, the whole globe. But if you want to tell a story to the whole globe, can't offend anybody in any culture. There's a lot of cultures out there to offend. It has to appeal to all age groups, and you, know, you have young kids and older adults, and they have different interests, and there's all kinds of different interest groups out there. So the wider your audience becomes, the smaller the possible stories that you can tell. So when I started to work, after I graduated from school, it was great. I, I had a thesis film that had won a few awards, and I had a lot of tech experience, so I was immediately able to start working at all the biggest visual effects and animation companies. And it was really quite fascinating, because as a kid, you think, studios, magic, they have the power. But once you go and you, you look behind the curtain, it's the opposite you actually see that they're only thinking all the time what you care about. There is no magic there. They're trying to figure out, how do I make this story? So this has become a bigger problem for Hollywood. And what I'm trying to show here in these graphs is that over the last few years, after almost a century of continuous growth, there's starting to be a decline in the appeal of Hollywood movies. Now, this is uh, DVD sales and rentals, and that's where the real money is in Hollywood. People think it's in tickets and box office, but that's not true. That's just the lost leader. That's what they get you to, to give up the big bucks. And this is what has them really worried. So the question is, what's going on here? Is it internet piracy? I don't think that's what's going on here. Is it 
economic downturn? Well, no, that doesn't work. It started before the economic downturn. Uh, is it that Hollywood just makes bad movies? Well, no, they've made plenty of bad movies before. So what's, what's going on is actually something a little bit more fundamental. We have to go back to caveman days, or in this case, cavewoman days. I don't know why people only talk about cavemen. But back in the old days, before we had film, if you wanted to tell a story, you had to go to someone in person and say, hey, Ugg, I want to tell you a story. And that was great, because it was two-way communication. But Hollywood has a unique problem. They're not a two-way story. And the reason for that is the first technology we invented after we started talking to each other was writing in books. And that was great, right? You could send a book many, many miles away, and someone could read the story, but you, can't, you couldn't talk to the author. And every technology that we've ever developed since the book is the same way, right? We had newspapers, we had radio, we had film, we had television. They're great, but they're all one direction. So today, the new technology that's coming out is trying to bring us back to this time, right? All the latest and greatest gadgets are trying to recreate that time where you can be there with your, uh, whoever the friend or family person that you want to talk to as if there's no separation of space. So, and it's hard to do. But that's the weakness that Hollywood has. So what if you had a world where nearly every single person had the ability to do this, to have that direct interpersonal two-way communication? Well, the amazing thing is we now almost live in that world. There are 6.3 billion cell phones in the world, and the planet only has 7 billion people. So that's an awful lot of cell phones. And what's interesting is you go, OK, well, there's only so many phone calls I can do in a day. Well, what are everyone doing with these cell phones? They're not talking on them is the interesting thing. That yellow set of bars is the amount of time that people spend talking on the phone. Those red set of bars is the data usage. And that is from five years ago. This is very, very recent. So it's just exploded. So now the question becomes, what's going on in all that data, and why is it affecting Hollywood? So I know the next thing you're going to say is, OK, well, people are tweeting, and they're going to tweet some photos of their lunch, and that's really boring. And that doesn't really tell me anything about why people would stop watching Hollywood movies. But the problem is, and by the way, this is from last year, so it's even more complicated than this chart, but the other chart wouldn't fit on PowerPoint. It, but the point is that these are the baby steps. People are trying to figure stuff out. They're trying to figure out how to give you that power to tell stories. And while it might seem inconsequential to tweet lunch, there are cases in which the cell phones do have real power. So I want to give an example of that. And the first example is the Arab Spring. A lot of people talked about it being the Twitter revolution or the Facebook revolution, but that's wrong. Almost nobody in the Middle East is on Twitter. Uh, on this chart, less than 1% in most countries. Facebook is a little bit more widespread, but still, and these charts are from this year, so last year when the revolution happened, they were even lower. So basically, most countries, less than 10%. But what happened is everybody in the Middle East pretty much has a cell phone. I know it says 101%, and the reason that there are more than 100% is because a lot of rich people have more than one cell phone. So not everybody has a cell phone, but it's pretty ubiquitous. It's not internet, it's the cell phone. And that's what created the situation. Now, I don't want to mislead you and say, oh, cell phones cause revolution. No, a fucked up society causes revolutions. <laughs> the cell phones just make it spread a lot faster. Because when Mohammed Bouazizi lit himself on fire, he was in some small rural town in Tunisia. Al Jazeera is not there, CNN is not covering it, but all of his friends and family were there and they recorded the protests and then that was sent to everybody else and that's what allowed the protests to spread so quickly and be so effective. So once again, you're like, okay, that's great. We can see how cell phones plus video and internet suddenly create upheaval, but it's still not Hollywood storytelling. How do I get to that sort of next level? So I want to talk about the Coney 2012 viral video. Can I see a show of hands? Did, how many people are familiar with that viral video? All right, interesting, half. So it was the viral video that talked about the Ugandan 
uh, warlord who you know, steals children. And it was huge among young people. And it's the most watched viral video over the fastest amount of time on YouTube. It has 92 million views as of right now. But the thing they want to point out to you is that red arrow down there. 37% of everyone who watched and shared that video did it on a mobile device. That's like unprecedented. And we know that this kind of viral video skews to younger people. The top demographic is girls 13 to 17 years old. By the way, the very, very distant second place is Facebook, which is less than a third of that. So the future is not Facebook. The future is definitely mobile. And that has Facebook very, very worried. This was in March. And around the exact same time, some of you may have heard that Facebook bought a company called Instagram for a billion dollars. So because I work with a lot of tech startups, a lot of people would come to me and say, why would Facebook, this giant company, buy this tiny, tiny little company for a billion dollars? Well, the reason is because Facebook has a dirty secret. Facebook is not a social network. They've tricked you into thinking that they are. But really, they're just the world's largest photo sharing site. And that's why I love this chart. It just shows you how much more photos they have than everybody else in the world. And even Instagram is just this tiny, like, rounding error. Right? We're all spending time trying to untag ourselves from those photos where we don't look good. <laughs> that's where Facebook sells you advertising. So Instagram, for those of you who don't know, now to talk in uh, our earlier talk, it's attempts, it basically, with one button, you can try to create sublime beauty. You take a picture, you apply a filter, and then you get to tell a story. So this is the beginning of that whole process. And the reason that Facebook bought it is right away, this started to explode in popularity. And because it's mobile, that's where all the young people are. And Facebook realizes, just like I showed you on that Coney 2012 slide, that the future is with young people and with mobile and is not going to be on web or desktop. So I want to briefly go over, there's a whole huge ecosystem of amazing apps out there that are trying to get into the space and take storytelling to the next level. The first I want to mention was Cinemagram. It's an amazing app where you take a short video and then you paint on it, and the area that you paint on becomes an animation. Viddy, which is basically like Instagram but for short videos, has exploded in popularity recently because they've integrated with the Facebook Social Graph API, which I don't have time to explain. Chill, uh, a great startup by some friends of mine that basically figures out what are the most popular videos that all your friends are watching and then you get to share with them. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's Hollywood content or not Hollywood content, so that whole line is blurring. And then there's a, another category of apps which are a lot of the startups that I work with which are trying to even do that next generation of apps. They're trying to tell stories in a way that Hollywood can't. They're trying to use like the geolocation in your phone and uh, the light sensors and other kinds of positioning sensors in your phone to do things that you could never do in a Hollywood movie. And I don't want you just to think that it's only tech companies that are having all the fun. Uh, the studios have also figured out that technology is the future and they're trying to move in that direction. And so they've created all kinds of different production companies and studios to create content. Uh, there's so many, I couldn't even fit on the slide, I just got bored of searching for logos on Google Image Search. But the point that I wanted to make was, most of us just look at our phone as some thing that buzzes and annoys us every once in a while with an email from work. But the reality is for most of the world, they're having that same moment that I had when I first saw that animation program in 1993. This is really a tool that allows you to finally to tell stories the way that you want. I mean, I know that everybody has in their head a movie or a story that they want to tell, but they just don't have the tools or resources to do it. But we're now going to be in a world where you're going to have that pocket computer at any time and you are going to be able to tell that story. It's like freeing that kid inside you. There's, the keyboards are going away, you're able to talk to the phone, it can record HD video. All of these are just steps to that future where you can communicate your imagination. Thank you.